tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Dr. Daryl DeRiker. He's the chair of the anthropology department at Texas A&M. Uh, and most recently, and I wrote notes because I'm not going to try to do this by memory. <clears throat> Uh, his research originally centered on uh, Australopithecus of South Africa. Recently, he's been concentrating on the early representatives of the genus Homo. In 2010, he and his team announced the discovery of a new hominin species, Australopithecus sediba, which he'll be talking about tonight, I believe. And again in 2015, with the discovery of another species, Homo naledi. So please, if you will, join me in welcoming Dr. Daryl De Reiter. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. All right. Howdy. Howdy. Sorry, Texas A&M. I'm required to say that. So um, what I'm going to be talking to you about today is not just these discoveries, but their relevance for our understanding of human evolution. I'm going to move that a little bit farther away. How's that? OK, I can. Yeah. So. In the field of paleoanthropology, I am a paleoanthropologist, there are numerous questions, numerous research directions we want to go in, but there are three really big questions that we want to try and answer. The first question, and I'm going to see if this is working, there we go, yep. The origin of our lineage, of our entire human lineage as bipedal uh, erect walking apes possibly somewhere uh, north of seven million years ago. That's one of the questions we're interested in. Another question we're interested in is the origin of our own genus, the genus Homo. Where did that come from? What were our immediate precursors? What led to the development of the genus Homo? And then the third question is the origin of our own species, Homo sapiens. Where did we come from? And the first one, I, I've never really been interested in. I've never looked for any of the old ones. I hope that shows up. It just turned gray. I've been more interested in the origin of the genus Homo from its Australopith precursor. But more recently, I also became uh, involved or interested in the origin of our own species, Homo sapiens. Paleoanthropology as a science is discovery-based, and you never know what you're going to find, where you're going to find it, or when you're going to find it, or what it's going to be. So I got involved in a question that I never thought I actually would get involved in in South Africa. And I'm going to bring you to that in a little bit. But I want to talk about a metaphorical fence between an Australopith and something in the genus Homo. So Australopiths, if you've heard of them before, they are bipedal, usually small-bodied, uh, usually mobile in the trees, eating a very chimp-like diet, small brains, relatively long arms, relatively short legs, living a life very similar to a chimpanzee. And yet, they are bipedal. They walked upright on two legs, which indicates that they are related to us in some direct capacity. On the other side of this metaphorical fence is something in the genus Homo. So rather than being relatively small-bodied bipedal ape, the genus Homo, that's the one that we belong to, they tend to be larger-bodied, what we call upright striding bipeds. They have long legs, relatively short arms, body proportions similar to us, very narrow waist, and I apologize for not having a very narrow waist, but narrow waist nonetheless. Very efficient, striding, bipedal animals. Not very capable of moving around in trees. For instance, if you've ever climbed a tree, you did so when you were very young. Try and climb one now, it's not as easy. We're just not suited for that. So they are two fundamentally different body plans, two very different ways of making a living but organisms that are in some capacity related to each other. So we're going to explore first off the Australopith side of this metaphorical fence. And we actually know a great deal about these Australopiths. I'm going to just show you a sample of some fossil discoveries over the past few decades. But we know a great deal about their overall body plan, how they made a living. 
So you probably recognize the famous Lucy fossil from Hadar in Ethiopia, about 2.9 million years of age. Uh, more recently, a little fellow called, uh, I forget their actual name, what they call it, but it's from a place called Dikika in Ethiopia. Uh, beautifully preserved, very young Australopithecus afarensis. That's the species to which Lucy belongs. More recently in South Africa, this skeleton was discovered actually in 1998, but it only recently, in the last couple of years, has been available for study. It was encased in a lot of solid rock. But we know a great deal about these guys. We've got every part of the body you would need to explore to understand their overall body plan. Skulls, vertebrae, ribs, shoulder, blades, arms, legs, pelvis, everything we need. So we know a good deal about them. In contrast, the earliest representatives of Homo, we don't know nearly as much about. So we have hundreds of fossil representatives of Australopiths, thousands of actual fossil pieces, but hundreds of individuals. But of early Homo, we know very, very little. And for decades, up until the, the 1950s, or 1960s even, the only thing we really knew about early Homo in Africa came from South Africa, a site called Svartkrans. Um, arguably the most important fossil site ever, and I say arguably because that's where I did my dissertation research. All we had were just a few scraps of early Homo, probably representing Homo erectus. In the 19... 60s, Lewis Leakey started to discover some very important fossils at a place called Olduvai Gorge. And I spoke to some of you about Olduvai Gorge earlier, and this is it. Sorry, glorified ditch. It really is. That's tire tracks. It's not very big, but some fantastic fossils have come out of Olduvai Gorge. Not a lot of them some very important ones, but there's not really that many of them, scraps, bits and pieces, some parts of the skeleton, although uh, a colleague of mine has now indicated he thinks this is not early Homo, and that would mean this probably isn't either. So we know almost nothing about their skeletons, which is unfortunate, except for one guy. This is the Nariakotomi child from Kenya, from West Lake Turkana in Kenya, beautifully preserved skeleton. It tells us a great deal about Homo erectus. But by the time we meet Homo erectus, this is 1.65 million years old. It's on the human side of the fence. There's no question. It is on our side of the fence. It has long legs. It has short arms. It has a barrel-shaped chest, not an ape-like tapered chest. It has an erect, striding, bipedal posture. It's our side of this fence. Other potential representatives, Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, were discovered, but we know so little to literally possibly nothing about their skeletons. So we know a great deal about the Australopith side of this fence, and we know a great deal about part or some representatives of the Homo side of the fence. But the problem we have, and, huh? I work with PowerPoint a lot. This is 2.9 million years of age. This, the oldest representative of this is maybe 2 million years of age. So that's a 900,000 year gap where we have nobody. We don't have good fossils in that time range. So for decades, this, you know, Australopithecus africanus from South Africa was the only one we knew. It was the only one in that time range, therefore, that must be somewhere between that to that to that. It was never a comfortable fit because this doesn't really look like that terribly much. But it's all we had. So based on available fossil evidence, that was the hypothesis we worked with. So we're going to be talking about new evidence coming to light and what that means for our understanding of the differences in this metaphorical fence. I say there's nothing between them. There are little bits and scraps little bits and pieces that are yeah, two, two and a half million years of age. I quibble with my colleagues in East Africa because the fossils that they discover are usually surface finds. And you have to assume when you pick something off the surface that that's where it dropped two million years ago and hasn't moved since. Not an assumption I'm comfortable making. 
So we have bits and pieces and a couple of older pieces from Ethiopia that my colleagues suggest are ancestral to Homo. I suggest are perhaps not. But the whole point here is that, and it's been said many times by many people, if you took all the representatives of early Homo that are more than, let's say, 1.8 million years of age, take every single fossil in Africa, you could fit them all, you know where I'm going with this, you can fit them all in a shoebox, and you could still put the shoes in the box too. There's just not much there. So that's where we found ourselves in 2008 when a colleague of mine, Lee Berger, at the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa, my former doctoral dissertation supervisor, actually I was going to say Lee found it, but his son, Matthew, nine years old at the time, found one of the most important fossils ever discovered at a place called Malapa, which is very close to where some of those fossils I just showed you came from. Malapa itself, so we have a, a lot of fossil deposits that were known all the way back into the 1930s. And we were told, you know, with, with Lee and myself and others of our team, we wanted to go find something new. And we were told, you know, it's not worth it. You'll never find anything new. Everything's been discovered. Turns out it wasn't. So way up here off to the northeast, we found a site called Malapa. Uh, this is what it looks like today. It's got this beautiful superstructure to help with excavations. So what did we find there? Well, we found skeletons. You notice skeletons. I've shown you pictures of skeletons, and I've shown you just about every one we have. They are vanishingly rare to find a skeleton. Yet at uh, Malapa, we found at least two of them lying literally on top of each other in geological sediments. Now, here's the fun thing about science. In 2008, we had no earthly idea how to date these fossil deposits in South Africa. No dating technique. Carbon-14 didn't work. Potassium argon doesn't work. None of them worked. Until somebody somewhere, I don't know who, invented a type of mass spectrometer that could detect such tiny amounts of lead that it allowed us to study the uranium lead decomposition and therefore directly date these fossil deposits. I'm not going to go into the details of that because that's physics and not my thing. What we can do though is everything that's blue here, we can date that material. So, the fossils that we found, these two skeletons that we found, are literally lying on top of this blue material that is just over two million years of age. When we hone in just a little bit more on the date of these skeletons, they come back as 1.977 million years of age, plus minus 1,500 years. We've got it into a 3,000 year window. So that came out in 2011. In 2008, no idea how to date these things. 2011, the most precisely constrained fossil hominin in Africa. Science, right? That, that was a spectacular leap forward. But what we have here in these blocks is a remarkably well-preserved skeleton. Well, two skeletons, actually. So let me show you what they look like. This is a picture from years ago. So there's more of both of these. And in fact, this was on display a few years ago, actually in, in, in February of 20. <coughs> Uh, February of 20, just prior to COVID. And in fact, it was trapped in Dallas for several months because of COVID. What we're looking at here is the other half of this skeleton. So you see this part is missing. Well, here it is. And we've got up here, we've got vertebrae, we've got ribs, we've got scapula, we've got down here pelvis and lumbar vertebrae. We've got all of these bits and pieces lying out basically where you find them in a body. That is even more rare. There's only one other skeleton that's ever been found in that arrangement, which is, you know, wow. That's pretty remarkable to find this level of fossil preservation. Now, what does it look like? That's the crux of the matter here. Does it look like anybody we've met before? So do not try and read what is written in the blue or in the purple. Don't worry about what's written there. Just look at the basic amount on each side. And if we think of these as little angels and devils and whatnot on our shoulder, on the one side, we have Australopith. On the other side, we have early Homo. So what we have is a list of characters that make it look both Australopith and early Homo at the same time. 
So, if we're looking for that fence itself, not things that are on one side or the other, but the actual metaphorical fence between Australopith and Homo, here, in the estimation of me and my colleagues, we have something that actually is straddling that fence. It's sitting on that fence. So what does it actually look like? Well, the brain is small, like an Australopith. It's barely bigger than a chimpanzee. But what's interesting about the brain is parts of the brain, in particular part that we call the prefrontal cortex, that's an area of the brain in us, it's right behind our forehead, it's associated with abstract thought, higher order reasoning, future planning, things like that. That is expanded compared to any other part of the brain. Now, that's not to say that this is any kind of philosoph philosophically thinking ape, but it's on the path already to a complex cognitive structure, even though the brain itself is not much bigger than that in a chimpanzee. When we reconstruct the pelvis, uh, for years, it was thought that the pelvis rearranged in order to facilitate birthing large brain babies. Because when we had Homo erectus, that Nariakotomi skeleton, the one that had the reddish background to it, that thing had a relatively large brain, but a relatively small pelvis, which means the babies would have had to be born relatively early in order to actually transverse the, uh, the pelvic canal, the birth canal. And we thought that's what caused the rearrangement of the pelvis. But it turns out we have, in Australopithecus sediba, a very human-like pelvic arrangement, even though the brain is scarcely bigger than a chimpanzee. Meaning, a pelvis that looks like ours for striding bipedal gait probably had nothing to do with brain expansion. And oddly enough, the pelvis had a lot to do with walking, which Shouldn't be that stunningly uh, different for us, but some of our colleagues got a rude awakening there. In terms of the uh, thorax, the rib cage, so in Australopithecus sediba, it's very tapered. In humans, we have a barrel chest, right? There's a big, broad chest. Apes, it's very tapered because of the way that they actually move their limbs and move around in their world. And we see that very ape-like arrangement in sediba. If you look at a human scapula and a chimpanzee scapula, just focus on this line here, the orientation of the scapula. In Sediba, it's much more similar to that of an ape. So if you add that ape-like arrangement of the scapula, that ape-like arrangement of the upper thorax, and then look at limb proportions, so here we have Sediba, we have a human, and we have a chimp, and they're all scaled to the same size humerus. So if we scale them just to the size of the humerus, we notice that in Sediba, it has a very long, relatively elongated forelimb. So it had an ape-like shoulder, an ape-like upper thorax, and an ape-like arm. What we're looking at is something that made a living moving around in trees. So in that case, it's on the Australopith side of our metaphorical fence. There are a few weird things, though. The thumb of Sediba is relatively very long. It's so long, it's actually even on, a, on relatively longer than in a human. So Sediba had the ability to do something that only humans can do in the ape world. Only humans can do this. Does that mean they were able to use and make tools? We would suggest, yeah, yes, that we haven't found any of these tools yet, but they had this capacity. So even though a very ape-like arrangement in the upper body, still a very human-like manipulative capacity. On top of that, if we look at the lower vertebra, so we get down into the lumbar range, much more human-like in Australopithecus sediba. And in fact, if we look at pelvic pieces and the femora, Australopithecus sediba had a very unique way of walking, what we call hyperpronation. Um, for the younger people in the crowd, some of you someday will have arch problems in your feet, you'll have back problems like me, and I have special inserts in my shoe to keep me from doing this, from rolling on the outside of my foot every time I take a step, because I hyperpronate. 
That's what Australopithecus, uh, Australopithecus sediba did. But it did so for a different reason than I do. For me, it's age. For them, it's because of the way they moved around. So this is a fossil, part of a fossil foot. There's the tibia. Right there is the talus. And here is the calcaneus. These are held together in material that we call breccia. And you can see in this 3D scan, in red is this matrix that's holding them together. And we're never going to take these bones apart because we can do it first off digitally. But the reason we'll never take them apart. This talus here is almost identical to what we see in Homo erectus. It's so very human-like. But weirdly, the next bone that attaches to it is very, very chimp-like. So much so that had we found them sitting side by side, we would be hard pressed to convince anyone that they actually belong together. That they're just so radically weirdly different. And yet, here they are. That's a foot. That's how we found it. So they had the ability to hyperpronate plus actually a mobile ankle. Or sorry, not ankle, a, a heel bone, a mobile heel bone that would allow them to basically rotate their feet sideways and climb up into a tree. So very much they had a distinct set of human-like characters, but some very Australopith characters. And to us, this looked like a very good transitional form, an intermediate form between an Australopith, like this is a reconstruction of Lucy, and Homo erectus. This is a reconstruction of Neria Katomi. Somewhere in the middle, with features of both Homo and Australopithecus, melded together into one thing, one, tip, one overall animal. So what we're looking at here is that metaphorical fence. And to me, that metaphorical fence is the ancestry of the genus Homo. This, these skeletons, Australopithecus sediba, looks more like genus Homo than anybody we've ever met. And yet its overall way of making a living, small-bodied, small-brained, uh, we know it had a diet very similar to chimpanzees. We had, it had a great deal of mobility in the trees. It's making its living like an Australopith. So we put it in the genus Australopithecus, and yet interpret it to mean that it's the most human or homo-like thing we've ever met. So this is something that Charles Darwin would predict, transitional forms, forms that bear characteristics of their ancestors but also bear things that look like what their descendants will someday look like. So for me, I always thought that that would make Darwin really happy. If you see what's going on there? Uh, uh, uh. uh I took that, this is just so you know, uh, took that frown and turned it upside down. I, I literally did that just to make him look a little happier. This is what Darwin predicted we would find. And it is where we pred he predicted we would find it, somewhere in Africa. So. I like to think of this as really solid support for Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Now, that's where we stood by 2013. Things were looking good. We had this new fossil discovery under our belt. It's time to kick back and take a break, right? And then, uh, Rick Hunter and Steve Tucker, two cavers, and, you know, in collusion with Lee Berger, he sent them underground because he thought, you know, we found Malapa literally under our feet. Lee and I had visited Malapa decades earlier in the 1990s, but because there was a fence running right through the middle of it, we never actually got into it. We had been there before. It was under our feet the whole time. Let's look what else is under our feet. So he sent these lunatics, these guys are nuts, to go caving. What's down in the deep, difficult to reach, the hard to access parts? And the first place they went into was a cave called Rising Star, which is literally right across the street from where these world famous fossil sites that we've now known some of them for a century, right across the street, under our feet again. And they went into this deep, dark, dank, nasty, stinky, filthy ugh, cave that I will never go into. They're welcome to it. And they sent us back some pictures. This was the first time they went into this cave. So they sent us back, there's teeth, there's a jaw, and we're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. So they went in there, took these pictures, and here you can see an outline of a skull. There's more bones, this is just stuff lying around on the surface. 
They brought these pictures up. They showed them to a colleague named Pedro Boshoff. He drove them over to Lee's house. Lee took one look at them, emailed them to me and a colleague named Steve Churchill. And this is all within about 12 hours. And like, wow, we, okay, we got to organize something and get these bad boys out of there. At first, we thought there's just going to be one thing, one skeleton, in, out, get, grab, you know, we're out of there. That's all we're going to have to do. But the logistics of getting into this chamber turned out to be nightmarish. To get into and out of this cave, it is the most difficult to access cave I've ever seen, and I've never even got close to getting to the hard parts. So we actually, or Lee put out a, a call on Facebook. Um, and he didn't tell his secretary, Wilma, that he was doing this. And he put out a call saying, if you have caving experience and archaeological experience, we need small-bodied, very fit people to get down into this cave. So Wilma started to get emails like, hi, my name is Sally. I'm five foot two. I'm very athletic. I'm like, oh, my God, what, is, what has he done this time? <laughs> that, that's probably not a good look. But it turns out. We came up with six extraordinarily uh, capable, gifted, and well-trained, what we called cave astronauts. I don't like that term. I prefer troglonauts because that's really what we're talking about. <laughs> Anywho, these six cavers were literally insane enough to climb down into this deep, dark, dangerous, deadly, nasty chamber to recover these fossils for us. And I mean, this is dangerous work getting into and out of this cave. The tightest, ch this, is a, this is an area, I believe it's called Superman's Crawl. So this, the, these cavers have these weird names. So when you're crawling through this, you look like Superman flying, except you're scrabbling through the dirt. That's about 10 inches high. The hardest to access part is up a, ch up a, a thing called a dragon's back, because I guess it looks like a dragon's back. You climb about 45 feet up. 45 feet up this thing. Access through a choke point that at the only accessible part is eight inches. Eight inches. So it's enough for your head to squeeze in as long as you turn it sideways. That's how difficult to access this thing is. And then 50 feet down into this chamber to recover bones for us. The cave has always looked like this since it opened up to the surface millions of years ago. So it's not a recent geological thing. This cave has looked this way for millions of years. Difficult, dangerous to get into and out of. We had to cable, like lay down about three miles worth of electrical cords, cables, because we had to have electricity down there. That could be power. The cave is 100% humidity, about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's hot. It's humid. There is no air movement because the chamber is a dead end. It is dangerous, caustic. The equipment doesn't last especially long because it's just such a horrible environment for it to work in. Uh, you know, they had to <laughs> take these bizarre perches just to be able to access these fossils without damaging them. We have lights, we have cameras, we have action, all of this stuff in the cave to allow not only the cavers to conduct their research, but for a group of scientists to sit out here in the open, in the sun, with the breeze and the birds chirping. I would normally sit right there where Peter Schmidt is right now. I could look outside and there's no imminent death. It was wonderful. I'm telling you, this was so dangerous. We told the cavers, plan A, if you are injured in the cave, plan A is you crawl out on your own steam Leave a blood trail if you have to, but get yourself up. If you can't, get out under your own steam. Plan B, we will bring food and water to you every day. We will remove your liquid and solid wastes every day. We will have a doctor monitor your health, but you will live there for six weeks, hoping we don't run out of oxygen. That's plan B. It's the best we had. And they're all like, yeah, cool. Let's do that. <laughs> when do we get in there? These guys are nuts. So in a couple of separate excavation episodes, we didn't want to be in there too long because there's no air movement. So the longer you're in there, the more you're uh, you know, breathing up the oxygen, spewing out carbon dioxide. In there for a few weeks at a time, come back six months later, a few more weeks, right? do it in short intervals like that. 
and we recovered about 1,800 fossils in our initial, well, 1,500. We brought it together, something never been done before, um, brought together a group of the most gifted young researchers on the planet. Normally in our field of paleoanthropology, what we do is you find a new fossil, you hoard it, you tell everybody you've got it, you show them little glimpses of it, but they're never allowed to touch it. It's not a real good way to do science. We thought we we're going to do that differently. Initially, we decided we were going to target the graduate students of all the people who are hoarding fossils that we knew of and invite them. Come and look at this new thing. And then we just expanded even beyond that. We got 40 of the most gifted young researchers from you know, South Africa, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Kenya, China, Croatia, United States, France, England, Germany, America, Canada. I mean, we've got people from all over the place. Japan. And just brought them in and said, you work on this stuff. The project leaders, myself, Steve Churchill, Lee Berger, we stayed out of it and said, you guys tell us what you think. We're not going to tell you what we think because we don't want to skew your perspective. And they did an amazing job with just a fantastic assemblage of fossils. So what did we actually end up with? Well, we came up with several skulls. We've got, eh, depending on how you count little pieces, seven or eight skulls. We've got at least 20 individuals. Right now, we've got well over 2,000 fossils that have come out of this. And to scale that, that's more than every other fossil site in South Africa put together. And we've only been there a couple times. Relatively complete. The cave itself is quite destructive. The fossils are not always especially well preserved, but we are able to piece them together as best we can. So we've got a few individuals, bits and pieces from here and there. Over 20 separate individual animals, ranging in age from literally either a neonate or something that was prenatal. It died before it was able to be born. That very young to something that was so old it was basically gumming its food. Right? There were literally no teeth left. They're just worn down to the jawline. And multiple, oh yeah, so here's a tiny little baby. We have even younger than this. So this is, in human terms, less than two years of age. We have things that are even younger than that. All the way to this, I call it grandma because, man, those teeth are worn down to the jawline. Very, very worn. 20 at least individuals. Most of them we know from when we put the teeth together. And the problem is all of these things are jumbled up together because the, in the last several hundred thousand years, the water table in that area rises and lowers. That's a normal, natural process over the span of thousands of years. Sometimes the cave was underwater, sometimes it wasn't. And what it would do when it's underwater is that basically scatters everything around. So trying to decide which tooth belongs to what group, that's a difficult task. But some of the preservation and some of the things that we got out of there, some of these things were not all mishmashed up. Some of them were actually together in singular units, and that's spectacular. Find that kind of preservation. Uh, as we began to explore elsewhere in this cave system, we started to find additional fossils, not just in that main chamber. That main chamber we named the Dinaledi chamber, which technically in the Sutu language means star chamber. Eh. That has some connotations we didn't think about, but too late. Dinaledi is what it is. In another part of the cave that we call the Seti Chamber, we have these side passages. They're naturally formed. They dissolved out when the cave was underwater. Uh, slightly acidic water would dissolve these little channels. So here we have, this is Marina, one of the, she's the lead excavator. I know it's her because Marina was the only one that insisted on being barefoot all the time. Just because that's less likely to damage a fossil if you happen to step on one when it's buried. If it's there on the surface, you're not going to step on it. But you don't know what's an inch under the surface. Oh, can you still hear me? I think the mic went out. Battery's dead. Okay, I'm going to have to use my lecture voice. Can everybody still hear that? All right. So, in some parts of the chamber... There is more bone than sediment. 
So that makes it really hard to excavate anything out of that sediment when there's not much sediment. Every time you're about to dig a bone out, there's something underneath it. And then you have to dig around. Oh, there's something beside it. And then you have to go down here, and then there's something else there. And the best way to excavate these things was using toothpicks. So Marina furiously hoarded toothpicks from every restaurant we ever went into in the country. Oh. Oh. See if it turns on. How's, how's, oh, how's that? All right, I'm going to do that. I'll try not to get these confused. So the excavation in certain parts of the cave was extraordinarily difficult, not just because it's hot, humid, dirty, and low oxygen setting, but because there's so much bony material. In this little side passage, though, what we found was something relatively unique. It's one single skeleton. So in Dinaletti, the main chamber where most of the stuff comes from, everything is all kind of jumbled up. We actually have a, a printout here, if anyone's interested in seeing it later on. So Lissetti is just a different part of the same cave system. It is absolutely homo Naledi. And one of the weird things, one of the many weird things about Naledi is just how much they all look alike. Normally, when we find fossils in these caves, we have to explain why the 10 skulls we got out of this cave don't look exactly like each other. Are they really all the same thing? Yeah, they are. We just have to accept certain levels of variability in physical form. We don't have that problem in Rising Star. They all look alike. Now, there's probably a very good reason for that, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. But Lissetti gave us a really good examination, or a really good look at one skeleton. We knew, all right, now we can figure out body proportions. Now we can figure out what its arms, legs, everything looked like, because we know this is all one thing. That was very beneficial. That was a huge advantage for us. So what did it all look like? Well, one of the weird things is body size and shape overlaps with living humans today. Looks like a small bodied, but people that are alive today, except for one thing, teeny tiny little brain. Relatively short arms. Oh, sorry. This, yeah, here we are. Relatively short arms, relatively long legs. That means probably striding bipedal gait. But with a brain, if we scale it to a human, a brain that is less than half the size of a human, possibly as little as one third the size of a human, that's a tiny little brain. And these things would have looked so weird because it would be, you would think that's a normal person, but boy, that, that head, there's something very wrong there. That is a teeny tiny little brain. They would have looked very strange to us, but maybe not too strange. Touch on that in a minute. The teeth are really weird. So I, I, my particular specialty is the skulls, jaws, and teeth. The teeth look really weird for a number of reasons. First off, if you just look at the surface, uh, the relatively simple pattern, nothing terribly complicated about them, that looks very much like human teeth. They're small, like human teeth, so nothing terribly unusual there, except in humans, this one here is the biggest, medium size, smallest. In Australopith, smallest, medium, biggest. In this one, smallest, medium, biggest. It has an Australopith arrangement of dental proportions, but has very human-like teeth themselves. So this thing is looking kind of weird. Oh. If we look at its rib cage, when we reconstruct the rib cage, quite tapered at the top. Well, that's ape-like, that's Sediba-like, but at the bottom, very powerful, very robust, and looking as, as strong-backed, let's say, as a Neanderthal, which is really kind of weird. There have never been Neanderthals in Africa. So it's very Australopith-like in some places, very human or homo-like in other places. If we look at the upper arm, so in humans, our humerus has what we call humeral torsion. So the entire bone, the entire bone has a twist to it. That's all of us. Australopiths, they don't have that twist. They're just really quite straight. And here we see a relatively straight, non-twisted humerus. Looks like an Australopith. The scapula is positioned relatively high on that tapered torso. That's, that's ape-like. So we're at the ape-like stage there. But when you look at the hand, 
A slight from finger bones that are slightly curved, I mean, that's, that's it. It's, it's a human hand. And here it is in the soil, just so you know, some of these things were actually what we call articulated. They were one, one piece. Now, there's something really weird going on with the hands. The pelvis, parts of the pelvis, so the pubis of the pelvis looks very much like human on, on the human side. But the iliac blade, so that's this part right here, is very flared out, very much like an australopith. So australopith up here, homo-like at the pubis region, another one of those mishmashes, but what's really weird, most places where sediba looks human-like, Naledi looks Australopith-like, and where Naledi looks Sediba or uh, Homo-like, Sediba looks Australopith-like. It's kind of this weird inverse image. And then the weirdest thing to me, the femur has a femoral head and neck that are, if you put that in a box with a bunch of Australopith femora, you would never be able to pick it back out again. Interchangeable. That's really weird. And now that tells us something. Oh, one last thing, the foot. The foot is, I mean, if you took any of these bones or the entire foot, threw it in a box with human feet, you'd never pick it out again. It's that identical, it's that similar. So what's going on there? Um, one of the things that we've, I don't know anyone in our team has ever, well, I guess Lee has said out loud a few times, we don't know what the hands and feet of Homo erectus looked like. We don't have fossils of them. The femur, parts of the pelvis, parts of the rib cage, scapula, humerus, are so primitive in Naledi that their lineage, their ancestry, must actually extend farther back than that of Homo erectus, because Homo erectus looks more like us than this guy does. So they must have branched off from that lineage before Homo erectus even existed. That's really weird. How does something that has a two million year lineage, completely separate from our lineage, have hands and feet that are interchangeable with human? How do you get that? Well now, let's talk about gene introgression. When different organisms of purported different species interbreed, sometimes genes are transmitted from one species to the other. Neanderthals are a fantastic example most of the people in this room probably have Neanderthal DNA in you because our ancestors interbred with Neanderthals. We're 100% sure of that now. So if we don't actually know what the hands and feet of Homo erectus look like, but we do know that Naledi has hands and feet that are interchangeable with humans, maybe we didn't inherit our hands and feet from Homo erectus. Maybe we inherited them from interbreeding with something like Naledi. That one gets uh, a few people a little bit angry, but, you know, we don't know what the feet and hands of Homo erectus look like. It's a viable hypothesis. Now, initially, we did not know how old Dinaletti was. Uh, and it took a few years for, first off, to find a geologist both capable, small enough, and willing to get down into that cave to collect samples. And finally, we did find one. And yay, Paul, because I don't want to go in there. We threw a number of different dating techniques at it. And without going into detail on them, out of the five dating techniques, they all appear to focus on around about 250,000-year-old age for these specimens from Naledi. Now, one of the wacky things in this cave is, even though they didn't all get there at the same time, it looks like they all got there very close together. And if they did, chances are that they got there very close together, possibly weeks, years, maybe centuries. But how did they actually get in there? If that cave has always been that deep, dark, dangerous, difficult to access, if it's always been that horrible, what are all those bones doing there? How did they all get there? So our interpretation was that they were deliberately positioned in that chamber after death. This is, for lack of a better way of phrasing it, the oldest cemetery in the world. Now, as soon as you say that, archaeologists tend to get a little upset. Archaeologists have 
I'll put it bluntly, yelled in my face, only humans have cemeteries. We know that because we've only ever found human cemeteries. Like, well, unfortunately, that logic is a little bit circular. If you're unwilling to recognize cemeteries and anything but humans, you're never going to find a cemetery that's not human. But what we have here is an extraordinarily difficult to access chamber full of bodies of one type of animal and one type only, Homo naledi. There's no one else in there. How do we explain that other than somebody put them there? Now, this didn't make us any friends amongst the archaeologists, um, but it's, to me, it didn't seem especially controversial. I mean, from the very get-go, we were as a team internally talking about, yeah, of course. I mean, we have to prove it, but yeah. How else do they get in there? We're not the only ones. In reality, humans are not the only ones that deliberately dispose of their dead. Neanderthals did it. One of the best examples is a Neanderthal burial, a place called Shanidar in Iraq. There are others, exa other examples in Israel, uh, in France, places where Neanderthals deliberately buried dead. We can even look earlier to Neanderthal ancestors in Europe at a place called Cime de los Huesos, Pit of the Bones, in the Atapuerican Hills in northern Spain. They find now, I think their latest count is 29 skeletons. They're about 400,000 years of age. In this deep, dark, horrible, smelly, difficult to access chamber, that sounds familiar, the bodies are thrown into this pit. There's only two animals in there. There's these guys, the Atapuera, the Sima de los Huesos hominins, and cave bears. There's a lot of cave bears in there, more than one would expect unless somebody was throwing these things in there. So to our team, it's not unusual, but we still have to explain a few things. So there's that ridiculously difficult to access choke point. That's Marina, I'm assuming there. You'll notice she has to have her head turned sideways to sit, fit down there. You can move in that other side there, but there's no foot hold anywhere below that. So you really want to go in the narrow side. It's always looked like that. It's never been more open than that. It's never been easier to get into than that. So again, kudos to these explorers, these troglonauts, sorry, cave explorers who went in there and got these fossils for us and continue to do so today. So here's that dragon's back. This is a, this is a cartoon. The actual path is far more convoluted than this, but climbing up that dragon's back, 45 feet up, about 50 feet down until you get into the fossil chamber. It's always been like that. There's nobody else in there. Nothing else, just Homo naledi. We've got hundreds of, sorry, thousands of fossils of them. Nobody else. No carnivores. No antelope. No rodents. There's nobody in there but Homo naledi. So let's rule out some other potential explanations. First off, were they living in the cave? Living in the cave in the Dinaledi chamber is very unlikely. There's no air, there's no light, although maybe there was a bit of light. Artificial, well, no. Extremely hard to get to, though. And why would you live in a chamber that that's, that's that hard to get to, that dangerous, and that unpleasant? They probably did not live there. Some of our colleagues suggested, well, in fact, that they were just getting rid of smelly bodies. So grandpa died, he stinks, push him in the back of this cave, and then we're done with it. Doesn't mean anything. That's not a really good explanation. If you really want to get rid of a body in that part of the world at that time, simply leave them out, and the hyenas will come and get them within hours. They'll smell it out. They'll come and get it. They'll take it away for you. No mess. So, oops. Apologies, I like playing Skyrim. This is supposed to represent just getting rid of a smelly body. That's not what was going on here. There's no indication of water movement, so they weren't washed in in some flood or some storm because water could never get up that 45-foot dragon's back. The water table has never been that high. So they weren't moved in by water. It wasn't some weird mass death. Uh, you know, the suggestion was made that maybe they all, there was a storm, Storm or something going on outside and they all climbed in here for safety and then couldn't get back out so they all died together. 
The problem is uh, we find multiple depositional episodes throughout this chamber and other parts of the cave system, which means it happened over and over and over and over again. And if your survival strategy leads to you and everyone you know and love dying every few years, not a good survival strategy. My favorite, though, was from some of our archaeology colleagues who criticized us for not considering humans as the ultimate cause, and apologies for the graphic, but the idea was that they were, I'm going to quote here, ritualistically slaughtered by humans and then stuffed down in this deep, dark chamber. Now, the person who said that, I'm thinking, that tells me more about you than Homo naledi. I'm going to be honest here, because, wow, if your first thought is that humans went about and slaughtered these guys and then, I guess, got embarrassed or scared of being caught, so they stuffed them in this chamber. No, there's no evidence of interpersonal violence. There's no indication that they were harmed and then murdered and killed or put in this cave. There's also no indication that they were hunted. Normally in caves in South Africa, when we find large concentrations of fossils, they're usually brought in there by things like leopards and brown hyenas who stash bodies in, down in these deep, dark crevices uh, to protect them from being scavenged by vultures and lions and what have you. They accumulate hundreds, if not thousands, of animal carcasses, including sometimes our ancestors were part of the meals. There's no carnivores in there. There's no tooth marks in any of the bones. And there's nothing but Homo naledi. So unless there was a specialized predator of Homo naledi that we've never seen any proof whatsoever of its existence, that's not an explanation either. We have every age range from possibly even prenatal to ancient, very old individuals. Multiple individuals, and they all look alike. I mentioned that before. Instead of having to explain why there's so much variability, we have to explain why there's no variability. They all look together, they all look alike. And if you think of this in terms of a cemetery, you don't bury your dead in some strange place of cemetery, and you don't let strangers put their dead in your cemetery. This is ours. And who does ours belong to? Our family, our lineage. So the reason they all look alike is almost certainly they're all related to each other. Over generations, this is a place that year after year after year, they ritualistically, maybe, disposed of their dead year after year after year after decade after decade, maybe after century after century. They all look alike because they're all very closely related to each other. So again, um, very difficult to access. We were also criticized for not finding another entrance into the chamber. I'm sorry, I can't find something that isn't there. But let's pretend that there was another access point into the chamber. That makes it even harder to explain why there's nothing but Homo naledi in there. Nobody else. If there was an easy way in and anyone or anything could get in there, why isn't anyone or anything else in there? In our estimation, because they never could get in there in the first place. But if that were true, then you would be looking at somebody going in and cleaning out the interlopers. That's even more behavioral inference than we're willing to go to. So, realistically, the best supported explanation for how all these things got in there is burial chamber. As we explore further in that system, so here in red, this is the main excavation area. This thing called the chute, that's that narrow little choke point for getting in there. As you move outwards, the area itself, the dolomite, is very heavily fractured. That's not at all unusual for that type of rock, to have these linear fractures in an almost geometric pattern. But what is really weird is, as we look along, if you can fit into these side passages, and some of them are really narrow, you sometimes find bodies in these tiny little narrow passages. And as far as we can tell, not mixed up jumbles of bodies, but one here, one there, one there, 
one there. What does that mean? Well, for us, our interpretation stands the same as it was before, that this is ritualistically disposing of bodies in an area that hasn't been used yet. There's no one there, so I'm going to put someone there. I'm going to put my beloved dead person there or there or there. Most recently, we announced um, a discovery of this. There's not much of it, unfortunately, but it is a little baby that was found. There's parts and bits of it here in, in golden is what's preserved as fossil. It's of a tiny little individual, a baby. That's why there's not much preserved because the bones are so fragile and they dissolve so easily in acid soil. So this was one of those unique, you know, spatially limited, I'm going to call it burials of a young individual that we found in one of those side passages. And we've got more of them and lots more of them. So for us, our interpretation of Homo naledi as systematic disposal of the dead is, I think, the best supported explanation. I know not everybody agrees with us, but nobody's come up with a better explanation for all of these things. So that's all I'm going to mention now. Unless anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take whatever questions you've got. Okay, I saw one over here first. So what is your hypothesis about how uh, the living Homo naledi made the climb without the, the benefit of the, the lights and all that stuff? Uh, that's an excellent question. As a team, we've always assumed that they had some form of artificial light, and presumably in the form of fire. I'm not revealing anything that hasn't been mentioned by my colleagues before. There was an announcement made about a month ago that there were traces of fire in this chamber. That's coming out. That science will be out very, very shortly. As to actually climbing in and out, I have no idea, because that is so hard to get in and out of. If you climb down a 50-foot chute to get in there, how do you get back out without somebody else helping you out? And I don't know how they would have done that, but we know that they did do that. Initially, we thought they would bring these bodies to this chute area and just kind of push them down there and they you know, disappear into the darkness. But as we go farther and farther and we find these little babies set along these side passages, well, somebody put them there. They didn't fall down and then tumble uphill into one of these side passages. Somebody put them there over and over and over again. Now, how they climbed in and out, I do not know. But, boy, they, they did it. Yeah. That was, that was my follow-up question because of that diagram. You said that uh, dragon's back. Yeah. So I think that what you're saying is the hypothesis they got to the top of dragon, at least at the top of the Yep. Dragons back and at least from there through them down, if not climbed in. I'm pretty sure they climbed in now. Uh, because that was my question, because if there's no water movement, how? No water movement. They had to be, had to somebody had to bring them up to the top of that dragon's back. There's no way they could get washed up there, float up there, nothing. Somebody brought them up and then brought them down, maybe, you know, dropped the body and climb in after it. But as we find more and more of these things along these side passages that are upslope, they didn't fall in and roll uphill. That doesn't happen. Somebody picked them up after they got into this chamber and moved them and put them over here, put them over there. Yeah? How do you know that the cave has never been more open than that? Uh, we have an exceptionally gifted team of geologists and geomorphologists who have been studying this cave, desperately trying to find any other entry, and there is no other entry. You also find uh, clear geological traces of water movement, there's no what we call uh, exogenous material. Or it, or it's what we call autochthonous. The sediment in the cave is not washed in from outside. It's actually comprised of simply the, the dissolution of the rock that used to be there. As it dissolves, it's, the particles are still there. That's what forms the soil. It doesn't come from the outside. Yeah? How do you know they're dead before they go inside? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I hope, really hope, given the sheer number of babies in there, that they were all dead before they went in there, because it would be really horrible to take a living thing down there and then make it a dead thing. We have to believe that they were dead before they went in, if only to sleep at night, because there's a lot of babies in there. Yeah? So, you said the main dig site was directly at the base 
of the tall pew, correct? It was at the base and then moving a few meters away from it. Does that imply that like the majority of them simply push them off, but then others would bring in the bodies and carry them off somewhere else? You know, we thought about that. Realistically, I think the reason that we have a bunch concentrated at that base is because that's the, the low point. And when you know, a, a water table over 1,000, 2,000, whatever year time span rises up, it simply shifts all the bone. It concentrates the bone. And we can see that happening in caves today when there are major floods. It just moves bone into big piles in the middle. I'm pretty sure that's how they all got there. And then they were originally maybe positioned somewhere else in that chamber and then just got washed into that central jumble. But how come like the other bodies scattered throughout these other tiny little alcoves didn't also shift along with them? Uh, presumably the water didn't get to the point where it was able to move them. They are upslope, possibly high enough out of the water table that it never impacted. But also, if they're jammed into these, these things, I mean, I could not fit in sideways to one of these side passages. People much smaller than me have trouble fitting in sideways. So if they're kind of wedged in there, they're not as likely to wash out. But maybe some of them did. But the fact that we still find multiple units in these side passages. And again, I'll just show you, you know, everything that's uh, a, a pink thing, that's a fossil concentration. And you'll note that they stop here. That's because nobody can squeeze further in. It stops here because nobody could squeeze further in. Yeah? So, so what are the narratives that's presented with um, human evolution on our lineage is that uh, gradually you had uh, our ancestors coming out of the trees into these open savannas and the body plant changed to accommodate that. But how, how does the Homo naledi specimens fit into that narrative or, or complicate that narrative? Is it still thought that they were spending a lot of time up in the trees? You know, we don't really know because, but they do have skeletal adaptations for moving in trees. They really do in their upper limbs, their shoulders, their upper thorax. It looks like they could still move around in trees. Whether they did or didn't, we don't know because the only ones we've ever met are in their cemetery. We don't know what they ate. We don't know what their world looked like. We don't know where they actually lived. I, I doubt they lived in that cave. They went into there for specific purposes, but they probably didn't live in there permanently. We know so little about the life ways and how they survived that it's difficult to say what they did outside the cave. But I think they, I mean, they had the skeletal adaptations for moving around in trees. So I think they continued to do that. I saw one. Yep. So have you all, like, excuse me, have you all really, like, focused any at all, like, around outside the cave for any sort of distance or radius? Yes. Yes, we, we have. We found other things that are not Naledi. We found other hominin fossils. They don't belong to Naledi. And which, you know, that's unfortunate, but also, you know, hey, <laughs> we got some new stuff trying to find more Naledi. That's it. The only Naledi that's ever been found that we're very sure of are in this rising star chamber. There are teeth and bits and pieces from other caves in the area that, you know, they're in the time range, but to say definitively that they're Naledi or not, we really can't. So as far as we know, they're all concentrated in that cave. Uh, yeah. So uh, maybe other people are better at uh, juggling all of the different names of these um, species in their heads, but what does a, um, like your proposed phylogeny really look like? Uh, some kind of precursor to Erectus, whatever that looked like, and in my mind, it's Sediba is a good candidate for that. That lineage to which Sadiba belonged, something branched off from that lineage that ultimately gave rise to Naledi. Now that means Naledi or its ancestry survived in Africa for two million years without us ever knowing at all that it existed. So the archaeologists who are mad at us about the burial stuff, I guess haven't realized what we also said about the stone tool assemblages of Africa because it's always assumed that it was either humans or Homo erectus that made every single stone tool in Africa. And it turns out there's somebody else that could have done it 
and now you can no longer automatically say that that stone tool is made by that species. They haven't caught on to that yet, which really ought to upset several apple carts because it calls into question everything that's ever been published on the stone tools of Africa. So, yeah, they're right there. So earlier, yes, um, the structure, the upper body structure for the Naledi, to answer the question that he asked, how did they climb, would the answer not be that because they were able to climb and travel, traverse through trees, they were happy that they were able to climb out of these structures? Yeah, possibly. They certainly had the upper body strength and the upper body capacity. What they would grab onto, I don't know, because those, those, those walls are not, there's no handholds, nothing. But clearly they did it. Maybe they formed some kind of a weird chain of Naledis, I don't know, hand to hand, I just don't know. But they did it. Uh, several of our colleagues said that, you know, there's no way that anything with a brain just slightly larger than a grapefruit could conceive of any of this stuff, so you're wrong. Well, sorry, but they did. I mean, the evidence is staring us in the face. Drop your assumption of who is smart enough to mourn their dead, and we start to recognize humans aren't the only ones that do that. So how, you know, yeah, they had the upper body strength to climb in and out, hopefully. Yeah. You said oh. that, um, No, go for it. Uh, you said that uh, some of them had teeth that were so worn down that it's like they were gumming their food like grandma's. Yeah. How do you know that that wasn't just erosion or something? Like, how, how were you able to tell that, like, after right. that was their age? You can tell dental wear that is a product of chewing over years and decades, as opposed to artificial abrasion where something gets just worn away by being rubbed against a rock or something you would see distinct marks if it was rock. And it probably wouldn't be every single tooth in the jaw, whereas on these ones it is. And it just looks very much like a human that is so advanced in age, the teeth are worn down to the gum line. It's a pretty characteristic look. Yeah. Well, um, don't, don't we have cave burials with Floriensis over in Indonesia? Um, I don't know. I, I know so little of Floriensis. I don't know if they're calling it a burial or not. If they are... Sure. And uh, secondly, well, I mean, the, the proof would be to find a second K. With Naledi? Yeah. Yes, it would. We got our eyes out. Okay. We haven't found anything yet. Uh, some of the crazy cavers are still working around in the area. But as we explore and try and find more, we do find more stuff. I haven't found more Naledi. But when you find another type of human ancestor, you can't just leave it lying there and move for more Naledi. You've got to focus on that. And that's what part of the team is working on now, is some new discoveries that we made in the search for more Naledi stuff. I mean, I, I find this argument completely convincing. I, I can't think, and I, I know that's not a great scientific approach, I can't think of another way they all got in there. I can rule out a whole bunch of ways I know they didn't get in there, and there's nothing left but deliver body to disposal. Yeah, you had one. Yeah. So I'm trying to lie. Uh, so you think that, well, actually, I can't, I'm kind of with you. I'm just wondering how they did it. And what comes to my mind is, I don't know if you've ever seen Jumper where the spiders come up out of the ground. So I'm trying to, like, imagine them just dragging dead bodies down, up and down, and mm -hmm. coming back out. And that's got to be stinky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I accidentally... Maybe no empathy. <laughs> Maybe no sense of smell. Maybe not. I actually climbed into a cave once many, many years ago that you had to actually go underwater and then surface, and a goat carcass had washed in. So it come out of the water like, Aah! and then it's like a oh, deep breath, and get out of there. Yeah, that would stink to high heaven in there. Absolutely. All right, I see people want to go. Does anybody have one last question? Yeah. I read an article that uh, mentioned a hearth and soot. I don't know about cooking, and you know, that's. I know what you're talking about. Since that's not research that I'm directly involved with, I can't really give you a meaningful answer because I just don't know. One of my graduate students is working on that, the exploration of traces of, of fire in that cave, and I, I really, honestly, can't tell you anymore. And I just don't know. Our team, though, I mean, getting in and out of this chamber, you would need to be able to see. Once you were like. 
20 feet in, there's absolute pitch darkness. You cannot see your hand in front of your face. In my mind, that means they must have had some kind of artificial light, and the only artificial light I can think of at that time would be fire. So to find traces of fire is not shocking to me, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, we found something that we predicted would be there, and sure enough, there it is. So uh, stay tuned, because that's going to be coming out sometime in the next few months. That, the, a far more detailed story of that. Okay, one more. Sorry. <laughs> uh, again, research that I'm not involved with because I have zero interest in stone tools. Uh, stay tuned in the next few months. Okay. That's all I can really tell you because, again, it's not my research, so I don't have, I actually don't have an answer for you. I don't know, but kind of know, but I can't say. All right, I appreciate your time, everybody, and thank you for inviting me.